This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Hello everybody, I'm Matt Vilesak. Um, I haven't done many of these, so I'm just gonna do my best. But I'm gonna talk about a little bit why I think I'm here tonight to begin with. Um, give you a little bit more of my background, like Jill had mentioned. Uh, go over a couple lessons that I have learned that uh, I think will help close the gap from the time you guys graduate till you go and become a successful entrepreneur. I'm uh, going to talk about a little bit about what's next for me, what I'm up to now, what I'm going to be doing next, and how what I've done has kind of helped build up for all that, and uh, why I think it's a good time to be an entrepreneur, leaving plenty of time for questions at the end. Jill, uh, how long do I have? About an hour? Yeah. And then 30 minutes questions? Say an hour and 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. Okay. I'll try to go quick fast. Okay. So. Uh, I got asked to do this lecture series, which was kind of a new thing for me. I mean, I've gone to Jill's class a couple times and uh, have a lot of fun with it. It's, it's great to see students who are interested in entrepreneurship, especially because I was there just a little bit ago. Um, but I'm going to set some expectations first. So uh, maybe I'm here to talk about tonight the time that I built that multi-million dollar brand you guys just haven't heard of yet. Um, that's not it. Uh, maybe when I invented the, uh, the Facebook killer, which you guys are still unreleased and it's going to be coming soon. Nope, not that either. Uh, or maybe the time I raised $5 million from the venture, new venture capital, uh, new venture competition that UCSB puts on, and that's definitely not it either. So basically, I'm here to talk to you because I graduated from UCSB a few years ago. I was literally in this room, I was telling Mike on the way down here that I was taking physics tests in this classroom less than six years ago. And um, since then, I've started a business. I've ran it uh, fairly well and learned a lot of lessons along the way that I totally think are valuable and worth sharing. And that's why. <clears throat> and uh, so what good is all that for you guys, right? Um, uh, the biggest thing I learned, even though I was very involved with TMP, was that um, uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to go out there. I know everything. I'm ready to do this. I, I've, I'm in TMP. I can start my own business, no problem, right? Um, that's not entirely correct. So there's a couple things that you, that, uh, you don't quite expect, you don't quite learn in the books, and uh, are absolutely valuable to know. And uh, what you think you know in UCSB isn't quite what is going to be out there when you get in the business world. It's a very different reality. Like I said, I was there where you guys are less than six years ago. So. My main focus <clears throat> through everything I'm talking about tonight is to basically help you avoid avoidable uh, pitfalls, setbacks, and struggles involved with starting a business and running one. So um, there's a couple just basic lessons that, you know, you know, if you keep in mind when you're going out there, it will just equip you to be ready to start a business. Uh, and so not to scare, but prepare. There are some scary ones, but don't worry, you'll be all right. Um, so in the reality is you're going to learn these lessons one way or the other, whether um, you do it yourself or you listen to some of the things I uh, can help share with you. So some of you may think that, oh, well, I'm going to have the next Mark Zuckerberg idea, and I'm going to totally, you know, I don't need uh, business lessons because I got the next new invention. 
uh, as I was doing a lot of research on him and following him along the way, it's amazing uh, how many things he and I uh, totally shared in terms of experience. We were both, he is seven days older than me, so uh, very similar in a lot of ways, which is amazing, uh, especially in how we learned lessons through business. Um, a lot of things were surprising. He, he started with a really good idea and went out there and tried to build a business out of it, and he failed in a lot of the same ways and struggled a lot of the same ways that I struggled with my little IT service company that is nothing compared to his, but um, very similar in terms of experiences and lessons, and so what I'm getting at is there's a common foundation between what he does and running a multi-billion dollar company versus a small business that uh, is trying to get out and get a startup going. <coughs> So to give a little bit of background, I, this is the most complex slide, but I'm going to try to get through it. Um, I grew up in Hermosa Beach, down south from here, uh, and, you know, born in 84, kind of like it, Mark. I uh, graduated from Redondo Union High School, uh, started school here in uh, 2002. Uh, in 2004, actually it was kind of 2003-ish, I founded Pacific Swell with business partner number one. Uh, he was um, uh, another... Uh, he was a, another uh, high school friend who was both it was interested in uh, computers and technology as well as I was. So we went and started to compete uh, this this Pacific Swell networks together uh, because we had a very common interest in computers. So a year later, we had, we initially founded as a general partnership, and we ended up forming an S corp a year later, where we actually become incorporated, filed taxes, so on and so forth. Uh, then we wrote a business plan uh, right a year before I ended up graduating from, from UCSB. So we built that so we can go out and we can raise some friends and family investments. So we raised about $50,000 worth of money from friends and family to get us started. And um, it's, it served us really well to get, get everything off the ground. So we opened, or well, I graduated from UCSB, business partner number two. Uh, he was another uh, college of engineering, computer engineer, that uh, was also interested in, in uh, engineering, and so we started up the business together there. We opened our office in El Segundo, so we let, rented out a 2,100 square foot area that we were going to use as our main operations floor, so we used some of that investment to get that started. We built our core software offering, and that was what we thought was our startup um, differentiator. It was a system that allowed us to provide effective tech support services to small businesses uh, th with that incorporated billing, remote management, uh, ticketing, all that sort of stuff. We, there was this explosion of technology reaching into small businesses at the time that was still relatively novel and new, and a lot of companies were struggling with that. So we built this whole business plan around doing that, and we built this software that would help us do that very effectively. Uh, in 2007, we uh, ended up landing our first big project. So coming out of school a year later, we landed this $100,000 project, which was awesome. And uh, it was just totally unexpected because we, we were just chugging along and what do we know and we're building these systems and we ended up getting this rather sizable project and just amazing how that all worked out. And so uh, all of a sudden we started seeing a lot of traction very early on. But as part of that, we used some of that money to start to develop something that we could resell over and over again. Being in the technical services, as you can imagine, we were just doing this, we were earning every single dime by going out and trying to do services for people. So we definitely wanted to see how we could make that more uh, recurring and utilize what we built. And so we started with this thing called Enzo, which didn't go anywhere. We then tried to do the same thing with phone systems. There's a, the emerging voice over IP was really starting to get out there in business. There's a lot of cost savings for companies to be had, and so we, we, I went after the small business by building some software upon open source technology that uh, we would market out and did fairly well with that piece. We then wrote um, some software called Bravora that is basically similar to what Twilio is today, if anyone knows what that is. It basically allows web-enabled applications to make and receive phone calls and text messages. So you can programmatically do these really neat things with, with communication tools and learn a lot of lessons through that one, but that one didn't end up going very far either. Then we had a very interesting part of the year where I ended up firing business partner number one. And uh, a lot of lessons in that involved as well that I'll, I'll get around to. 
We ended up partnering with another company because we couldn't, um, our IP PBX was getting, was losing to larger companies and customers. So we ended up partnering, if we couldn't beat them, we decided we'd join them and we'd go ahead and start with this. And uh, we partnered with this company to be able to resell their product. And it was another channel while we were trying to build up these other technologies. Then the economy started to tank, and everything that we had been working on started to become very commoditized. And we realized that because everything that we were doing all of a sudden became, well, can you offer it at a, the lowest price? And if not, then I'm going to find a guy who can offer it at a lower price and put, pin you two against each other. And it was uh, not the best way for, it was not the best environment for us to be working. But we did do, uh, well, but we did end up moving one more time because uh, our lease expired in El Segundo. So we got a second office in 2009. We built uh, some extra software for another iPhone app that would be uh, useful for people who had short tail systems. Um, when people would be traveling, you could just pull up your, your iPhone and you could redirect all your calls that would go to your office. Otherwise, they'd ring to your phone. So we created that and we marketed it to the short tail niche. It was a very small niche, but it was very successful. And so that was great, but as you can imagine, it was a smaller a smaller market, and so being able to have that be our only source of revenue wasn't going to help when we were supporting an office and whatnot. So then we end up closing uh, Pacific Swell in 2010. I'll get more into all that. Uh, I then got hired on by a customer of ours, which is Unwired Revolution, where I'm working today, uh, involved in mobility. We ended up building some software called Worklink that allows large enterprises to use iPhones and iPads for their employees. So whether they're uh, bring your own device where you bring your own phone and we can enable it to do email or we buy it for you like they used to do for Blackberries, um, that's what we would help with. And then as a part of all this is kind of what I've almost like a manifestation of a lot of stuff that I've learned in the past. I have another new project I'm working on called Presence that I'll be uh, talking a little bit about today as well. So that's my background. Whew. So I'm here to talk to you about, again, just to learn the easy way. Uh, a lot of my background is, again, in, in business to business technologies and services. Uh, I, we, I ran a real company with real employees uh, where I found um, you know, various people from, from tech, tech people to marketing people to sales folk to accounting and hired them and had a, at one point up to 10 people working uh, you know, for me at a given time. And we were creating something of value. We were either delivering a service or we were trying to build a product that we could market out there. We weren't just trying to resell something else or, or do anything of the pyramid scheme sort of stuff. We were actually running a, a full business that, where we were coming up with something original in terms of service. And ultimately, you know, take it or leave it. Again, this is from my view of, of the world and where I've been. I just think that it's great to be able to talk to you guys because I was where you were a few years ago, really wanted to start a business doing this TMP stuff. So I think it's good advice, but take it or leave it. So now to my 15 things. Um, the first, and I think the most important, is just absolutely do it because you love it. Um, it's the, the pa your passion for whatever you're going to do to start a business is the most important piece to the whole equation because you're going to go through some extraordinarily hard times <laughs> no matter what product you're doing or what service um, uh, where you just have all these different things happening that, that are not really enjoyable. <laughs> but uh, you but you got to just constantly have this kind of crazy drive that I really want to make this thing that I'm, I'm really passionate about. I want to see it go somewhere. I want to do something fun with it. And I'm going to put up with these things to be able to make that happen. <clears throat> so some bad reasons to start a business. Um, you know, if you just think that it's a cool title, you're not going to last long. If you think you're going to get rich quick, I always found it really funny how someone um, whenever I would say, oh yeah, I run my own business, they say, oh wow, you must be rich. And I was, no, <laughs> it's uh, not the case. It's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of hard work before you start getting the money, but the key is that you do something you love and then the money follows behind it and you don't even worry about it anymore. Um, so yeah, just to have a business bad, trying to think that you can just have your own schedule. Uh, you do have a lot of your own schedule, but it takes up a lot of the time of the day. It's not just your typical nine to five. The second item is don't guess your customer needs. Um, this is a classic engineer curse because engineers always want to go out and tinker things and make things better. And 
The problem is that you can't, you, you don't want to try to create a solution to a problem that actually doesn't exist or isn't a problem. Like, I, I found this and I thought it was perfect. It's a, it's a card stack for playing rock, paper, scissors. It's like, why would you need a card stack to do rock, paper, scissors? That is absolutely a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. And it's just stupid. And so, yeah, so maybe it's cool or maybe, you know, it's so much better in some way. But these are some real questions you need to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out if what you're creating is going to have value and if, if someone's actually going to buy it. There are a whole lot of people, if you go out there with some idea, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's the coolest thing ever. And then you tell them what the price is, and they say, oh, nah. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing how often that would happen. So you know, these are some questions you got to ask. So does, does the cost justify the benefit? Is, is, is Whatever you're charging, is it going to make it make either the company more money that's buying it, or will it make the consumer have a better life because they, uh, they, they invested in this? Is the current solution broken enough that it's worth the cost of doing that whole change? Um, another thing that totally blew me away was how resistant a lot of people are to change as far as technology is concerned. And a lot of things in business. You have people who have been around in a, in a business for a long time and they're used to their ways, they don't want to do things. I came fresh out of college here, we had a lot of cool ideas, a lot of new ways, looked at the way that things were getting done in business, I'm like, man, that is stupid. That is, we could make this so much better with all these ways, but for one of these three reasons, a lot of those ideas didn't go anywhere because at least one of those applied. And so really understanding why things will sell and how things will sell is, is critical. So part of that is investing the time to understand the real problems. Caveat of that is if you want to build something that um, for yourself, you know, like Steve Jobs, he built the iPod for himself because he really liked music. And so he's like, this is a cool thing that we can have for ourselves. So the only problem with that is you better be certain that there are a lot of yous out there that would be willing to buy it and are as, as passionate for whatever you're building as they are. Steve Jobs had a lot of luxury of being able to put something out there that was, uh, you know, he had the money to be able to build this sort of stuff at the time he was doing it. But, you know, he had a, a, fa a focus and a goal, and um, he had enough people that were like him, and it, that's why the iPod was so successful. Oh, partners. Partners, partners, partners. So those are the two founders of Google. Arguably one of the best partnerships um, as far as modern technology is concerned, um, as far as they go. So they could be a tremendous asset, or they could be your absolute worst nightmare. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, the statistic is that 70% of those of business partnerships don't work at all at any size or level. At some point, it breaks down. Um, the reason is because it's really easy to start a partnership if you have another idea with somebody, especially if it's just two people. You can say, okay, well, yeah, we're just going to go 50-50, and uh, okay, great, we're going to get this thing started. The problem is that it's easy now, but later on, when things start getting tough, little things start to come out about personalities, about egos, about insecurities. All these, these things that are very essential to a person that you don't necessarily see when you're building the initial parts of a business, when you're getting out there and getting excited. So my tip is to try to establish an ultimate decision maker. So have at least one person be the one that is the one that will ultimately call the shots. It's not easy to do, but it's uh, what I found works. And so invest time up front with the uncomfortable stuff really sit down and draft up what the roles and responsibilities of the partners are. Who likes to do what? What are the hot button issues? How can I avoid ticking this person off? Does this person have a certain sort of uh, thing they enjoy doing that could be uh, uh, debilitating to the business? And if so, how can we work around? And just really get all those interpersonal things figured out because they will come out. And they will come out at very bad times. And it's, it's happened twice for me, and not just those two guys. So it's a, it's a very tricky situation. And so part of that, in line with that, is that just because they're your friends or just because they're technically on the same level with you and share the same enthusiasm as you for, for a business idea doesn't make them an automatic good partner. Uh, they, may, they may be a great partner, but there's no such thing as an automatic partner. You still have to go through the exercise of figuring out 
uh, what this person that you're going to work with is more is all about. The reality is you spend more time with this person than you do a significant other by a lot. And so you learn to really you learn more about that person than you ever thought you were going to know. So it's important that you guys are on the same page really early on. So starting lean. Um, you want to invest as little time as possible to get your proof of concept out there. So if you have something, some idea brewing, something going on, and you think that you have some chance on it, don't try to build the whole enchilada uh, right off the bat and dump a ton of money into something because it may not work out. I had three examples of products there that uh, we were working on a little bit, we dumped some money into, and they totally dried up, right? But we were very happy that we ended up doing it that way because otherwise we could have spent a whole lot of time and money and effort on something only for it not to work out. And the thing I'm working on now, kind of, uh, that I'll talk about a little later, is a, is a good execution of that strategy of starting lean. So try to avoid taking any extra money. Uh, outsource, when you do start a business, you want to outsource as many core operations as possible to other entities. So uh, if you have, for example, if you're working on tech stuff like us, I'll take my, myself as the easy example, we're going to want to outsource some of our accounting to someone who actually knows what they're doing with the books. You don't want to spend your time trying to figure out something and then do it wrong, especially for something like accounting, when you can just pay a couple bucks to someone to go out there and, and take care of it. So some of the things we did was we opened an office um, with our, we, we did raise some capital early, and we, we started spending 4,000 bucks a month on an office building on this 2,100 square feet <laughs> location for three guys with the justification that, hey guys, the customers are going to come, we're going to need all this space so we could fill it up with our tech support reps, right? Totally the wrong way to look at it. You want to, you, to start from your house, start simple, start as low cost as possible, and then when you have so much business that you have to have an office, then go spend that 4K. And then, if, and then the $4,000 compared to the revenue that you're making with all those people, doesn't matter. But don't try to too early predict what you're going to need. And uh, you know, don't purchase server infrastructure anymore. If you're doing anything in technology or anything that involves software, there are so many cloud-based solutions and software now that you can go out there and you can build a proof of concept at a fraction of the cost. So your investment to get something started is next to nothing compared to even just a few years ago. And so you could really start lean. And there's a lot of articles on lean business models. And I think that that is uh, something totally worth looking into. But I will caveat all that with saying that once you do have a business plan, once you do have a proof of concept, you do want to make sure you're properly capitalized. You have the proper money to make it happen. A couple of those ideas failed, um, not because they were technically inadequate, but because we didn't have the necessary funds to really get it into the market and to make it compete. We were, uh, we were just trying to bootstrap it all. And you know it got us to a point, but there, it was not properly capitalized. On to number five. So learn to sell yourself. So you are your company's very best salesman because you love what you're doing, you know your product, and so you, the customer can ask you anything and you have an automatic quick answer because you are what you, you're representing your product. And you just exude this excitement about what you're doing. And people pick up on that. So the second part of that is, so you're selling your, your, best, your, your company's best salesman, but you're also um, convincing people to buy from you. So much of buying uh, you know, is not about the, the quality of the material. It's how much someone likes you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a weird thing, and you don't really think that it will necessarily work that way. But both in business and consumer decisions, especially if it's face to face, it's how you know, they will favor people they like. If prices are, are similar, or even if they're different, if they get a better gut feel from you because you, are, uh, you can communicate with them better and you can, you can just, um, they get better warm and fuzzies from you, they're going to go with you. It's, uh, it's like clockwork. And so you do not want to hire a sales staff too early. I made this mistake of hiring an SC MBA guy kind of blindly who worked with another customer that we had before and who got fired, probably should have realized that wasn't a good call. But you know, he, um, he, you know, he came with us these credentials saying, hey, oh yeah, well, you know, I have the SC MBA. I know exactly what you guys need to get this done. Me not doing many sales, I didn't know what to expect. I just threw my trust right into his lap. I said, OK, yeah, hey, you, you're the experienced guy. 
in some cases you got to do that, but there's a lot to be said about having gone through that process yourself and knowing what to expect. And although, you know, I'm a technology guy, I hate, hate doing sales, but I went out there and did it because now whenever I, I need to have someone do the sales pitch or, or I know what to expect from them and what uh, the timing, the turnaround, how long a sale will last and what sort of pipeline to expect, so on and so forth. So you don't want to hire a sales guy until you have it down cold so you can pass that knowledge off and uh, you are so busy doing your core offering, whatever your service or product you're creating, you're so busy cranking that stuff out, you don't have time to do sales. Then you consider hiring a salesman. But unless both of those are satisfied, um, salesmen are just a great way to burn money. And you can learn a lot of lessons about how, how your customer works by doing the sales stuff. Which leads me to 80-20. This, uh, this rule was taught to me by a guy who worked uh, at Xerox for years. He was, a, uh, he was a salesman for Xerox, and he sold copy machines. And so the goal here, and it was such an important thing for me because I talked a lot, was that you want to listen 80% of the time and talk 20% of the time. And it's, I think it's your single best strategy for validating your ideas and also finding out what your customer wants. I mean, it, it's, it's like, oh, obviously, you know, I need to listen to what the customer is saying, but sometimes you are so excited about what you're selling or what you're doing, you'll go out and tell them something they don't even care about. You want to ask them by leading questions what interests them and what, what they would like to see in your product or what... Uh, what their pains are, how can you, and, and this goes back to that rule of not guessing what your customers want. You're trying to get all this stuff out of them. And so if you're talking more than you're listening by any close margin, then you know, you're doing too much talking. How am I doing on time? <clears throat> so number seven, again, this is another painful one is uh, who you know is more important. The relationship aspects of business is amazing. I mean, I, again, came out of college, was building these really neat, cool technology solutions and that, that were helping make processes better and whatnot, but um, the best product doesn't always win. It really comes down to um, just who you know. I mean, is that classic of it's not, who you, it's not what you know, it's who you know, is abs absolutely holds true. And, I thought I could get around that with making something really cool. It works to an extent, but it always gets you. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges right out of college that I had starting a company, was that I had a lot of cool friends who were from UC Santa Barbara, but none of them had any money to buy what I was selling. And so this is definitely the number one challenge that I had. And um, uh, had I had some relationships, and every entrepreneur who I talked to, when I asked them, well, how did you get past this hump? How did you?" How did you get those first initial leads that got you going? They will always say, oh, relationships. You know, talk to guys who I worked with before, or they knew someone, and so on and so forth. But when you're fresh out of college, uh, still trying to figure everything out, it's a little bit difficult. And so that's, um, that's definitely the hardest part. And therefore, getting invited to the table. Uh, what worked for me was that people saw my energy when I got invited to the table. But a lot of times, people would not even ask me to I wouldn't get invited because they'd look at, oh, well, he's fresh out of college. I go with this guy who's fresh out of college, or I go with a guy who's been running a business for 30 years, uh, who knows this stuff supposedly inside and out. I'm going to go with this guy. And, and, and oh, and that guy has three references that, that are good. So that's, it's definitely an obstacle. It's not, a, not one you can't overcome. There are definitely those customers that will value your technical skill or your skill or ability or drive or passion, and they'll recognize that and give you the opportunity. But definitely be aware that there are those that won't. And so the solution to that is network everywhere you can. Um, I actually got a lot of my initial business through my dad. My dad plays tennis at a local sports club. And a lot of people there were running businesses or whatnot. So I told my dad what I was up to. And before I knew it, you know, half of our business were all from people that my dad had talked to after a game of tennis and said, hey. Um, my son's running this tech support company. Do you guys need any help with that? And got a lot of work, and a lot of our initial work all came from that. So, um, so have yourself network, <clears throat> and have others network for you. And don't. I did a I did a thing called a BNI. 
which is um, a business networking group. And one of the most important things I learned from there was that you know, don't ever think that someone, just because they're not right in your scope of a perfect customer, that they have no value to you. Because what ends up happening a lot of the times is they know, you, you tell them what you are able to do, they listen to that. Then they have all their network of friends, and every once in a while, one of their network of friends will vent to them saying, hey, well, we're having a real problem with our server. And so then they would say, oh, well, hey, I know this guy, and so on and so forth. And so there's this, this network that's out there that you just need to be able to tap into. And you can't be shy. You can't sit in your office and expect all that to happen. You have to go out there and meet people. And that's, that's the way you get your business started. <laughs> um, you want to watch out for those bad people. Uh, there's a lot of them out there, unfortunately. Um, uh, there's a lot of good people, a lot of people that will help you out with a lot of things, and I get to that in a little bit, but um, it's, it's, it's amazing. There are people that are out there that will uh, just totally take advantage of you. And you gotta, have, you gotta have your guard up, and you gotta listen to that you know, feeling on the back of your neck. If you get like, some weird vibes from someone, there's something there to that. Um, they will totally, t I mean, it's happened to me twice, where I totally gave my trust out and I just got burned, right? And uh, you learn from it, and you, you figure that out. But you know, just be aware that that is something that's out there that is a reality of, of the world. And so you know, you got, part of being an entrepreneur, though, is trusting and, and is to um, share responsibility and whatnot. But you know, you've got to be careful. Don't just openly trust someone. That was one of my big mistakes. So, but nowadays, you, know, you can look. You can do your homework online for someone. Uh, if another business, whether it's a business entity or an individual, if, they've, if they're really bad news, there's probably something online about them already who uh, saying that, well, you know, I got ripped off by this guy, or so on and so forth. So there's enough information out there that if you do a Google search, you could probably find something. So um, this is a painful but true one, and just something to keep in mind. And this, you know, so the way we operate as individuals is that if we don't pay our cell phone bill by a certain date, our cell phone turns off, right? If we don't pay our water bill, we don't pay all those other bills, stuff stops working for us, right? It's a little bit different in the business world in that you know, just because you ask for a bill and you say that the due date is by this time, it's not an automatic, OK, well, we're going to pay. Some cases it is, some cases it's not. It totally depends on the business, but it could be any size business. And the reason for that is cash flow. Uh, and, and a lot of that comes from you saying, and you not being an enforcer and saying, OK, well, I need this. Uh, you know, there's like this whole respect thing that comes to, around to it. Like, are you, I'm delivering this service for you, so I expect to have a payment by this time. And so it's a, uh, it's a little bit of a dance with every single customer, because some of them, it's not a problem. Some of them, they pay early, prepay. Some of them don't, and it's and especially when you're dealing with smaller businesses, it's a it's a challenge, and you have to approach one, each one differently. So the the tricks to that are to set expectations for payment. You want to figure out a good schedule, and you just got to work out that relation and say, hey, you know, if um if you don't pay by within these two dates, uh, we're going to stop doing work for you. As a small business, that's not as easy as it sounds. Whereas someone like Singular or Singular AT and T can go and just you know, turn off your service, they have millions of other customers that they're still getting revenue from. For you to do that, especially if you're in a market that is all a little bit commoditized, uh, if you stop doing work for them and tick them off or whatnot, even though it makes no sense because you're doing something for them, right? It's totally backwards. They will be like, well, you know, we expect a little bit of give and take here. And so it's, it's a dance that you have to learn and you can only learn by doing, but be aware that it's out there. So embrace the unknown. Um, you want to have a plan. You want to go out there with a plan. You want to have something that you are striving for. Uh, but don't lose faith if it doesn't quite go the way you're expecting it to go. There are so many variables that change throughout the process between your product, the market, just trends, there's different laws that get passed even that you know you need to navigate around. So you should definitely have a plan, but don't get disheartened if it changes. My favorite line was, I have no idea where I'm going to be in the next three months, when people would ask me, well, where do you see yourself in the next year or two? 
And the reason for that is because we were constantly figuring out where, where we were going to go. We had a couple neat ideas that if, if someone, if they latched on, we could be out of the park. You know, we could be doing really well. We could be totally have sold off and go where we want to go. Uh, conversely, we could be completely bankrupt <laughs> in three months. And so it was, it was one of those things where we had a goal where we wanted to be getting moving towards that really successful area, but we never really knew. Uh, we couldn't, we, and we didn't, you know, live or die by staying on a track. And so, in a way, that's an entrepreneur's most valuable asset because you're able to be flexible and take on risk and do all this stuff when a lot of people are scared of that. You talk to a lot of other friends who aren't doing entrepreneur sort of stuff, they want to go, they want to know exactly what they want to do in their life, they want to go find a job for that, and they want to go and work and have a career. And that's a way of living that's great, but those sort of people are not going to have the same level of competition with you to be able to just push the limits uh, that you need to do to, as an entrepreneur. And so you just need to be uh, fearful of it. Not, not fearful. You just need to be um, not, not afraid to really completely push the limits and, and uh, to just not know exactly where you're going to go, all the while having a plan in mind. So. <laughs> This is fortunately not another a problem, and I actually say that it's not for you guys either, but it's amazing how much this is out there. Um, a lot of people say they're going to do something, or uh, they're just going to show up, and a lot of people just don't show up. It's amazing, let alone show up on time. And um, same with delivering what they said they were going to do. They don't complete the work. I mean, so much of what you're just getting out of college right now is this ability. I mean, no matter what your major is, uh, I was just telling uh, the SEA group before this, uh, they asked, well, what do I get out of my computer engineering degree? I mean, what, what do I really take away from that? And the answer is not the computer engineering part. I mean, I did uh, maybe a little bit of software, but I built circuit boards that I will never build again or even think of doing. But what it taught me to do was be disciplined on getting a project in on time, getting uh, just completing the work, as the, to the best of my ability, and getting it out there, and getting, the, getting it in front of the teacher on time, and, and delivering it as it should be. I mean, it was a no-brainer. If I didn't do that, I didn't pass the class, and didn't get out of school. The consequences are a little different outside of business. You just don't get business. But if you can deliver on those things, you can really be a lot more successful than a lot of other people who just won't answer their phones, or just won't do this, that, and the other. So a big difference is just showing up and finishing what you started. So um, having a good cop and a bad cop. Uh, this is a very strategic separation of roles when you're running a business. Um, I try to be both a good cop and a bad cop at the same time. It doesn't work so well. So you have your good cop, which is uh, someone who's your subject matter expert. It's the person who, like me, would know exactly what they're doing. They're, they're the one that has all the passion for the business. They're the one who knows the technical matter. They know exactly what is going on. And so they're the subject matter expert. They're the guys going out there doing the pre-sales. They're getting the customers all excited after the lead has been brought in. They're going out there and they're talking to the customer and really wooing them with everything that your organization has to know. And they're telling you everything about your product, right? Then you have your bad cop. And so your bad cop is the guy that does the actual closing of the sale. He's the one that goes and like, you know, does the whole stare down negotiation thing when it comes down to the final price and to, to get that business sale. You know, you as a subject matter expert, you're the one who's just going out there and saying and getting them all excited about the, te the technology or the product. The other one's doing the hard business uh, closing the sale. Having those separated where the customer doesn't blur those two images is, is very valuable. Uh, they're the ones that do the hard calls to collect payments. I mean, they're the ones calling in, annoying the customer, knocking on the door of the customer's office to go grab a check. And um, they're the ones that are kind of the, the, the person that the customer doesn't want to really talk to uh, because they're, they represent just the annoying side of the business part, but the absolutely essential part. They also will help, uh, you know, again, handling customer disagreements, handling things that are more difficult and are not the fun part of running, uh, of working with your, you as a business. 
Um, now, the good cop and bad cop, they don't have to be partners. They can be employees. They, they, it doesn't have to be a partnership sort of thing. Um, in my company, I hired a guy who was our controller who played the bad cop. So he, he stood on top of all of our accounting, watched all of our books, so on and so forth. But because of that, by nature, he was also the same guy who was calling the customer saying, hey, we need your payment by this date. And uh, then he would go yell at me if I would keep on doing work when uh, I shouldn't have been. So, you know, the good cop always wants to help out. The bad cop wants to get the money in the bank. Different mentalities. So, mind the cash flow. Um, cash flow is extremely important to keep track of. This is a sample of um, what that controller put together, actually. So this shows us, you know, we had, a, <laughs> we had this color-coded column there that went from like green to orange, or to yellow to orange to black to like dark, dark black. And that's when, you know, we were keeping track of all of our incoming and outcoming cash. And we made a really early mistake early on. We, and it's easy to do this if you're not really focused on your books and if you're an engineer, and, uh, it's easy to do this for sure. It's that we landed that big project, right? So after we landed that big project, we had so much money in the bank, we didn't know what to do with it. We were just like, wow, this is amazing. We could obviously go out and spend a lot of this stuff on you know, improving our products and, and so on and so forth. What we didn't do was track all the cash flows because part of that was for buying equipment. Part of it was for um, paying off certain things. And so we were tracking it, kind of. <laughs> if we had been tracking it like this, we would have been a lot better off. What cash flow tracking allows you to do is keep an eye on every single purchasing and, and uh, uh, receivables, uh, purchasing decision and receivables, and how where it will leave you. So this was a, a part of a spreadsheet that had like seven scenario tabs in the bottom on the bottom of it, where we would say, okay, well, if these call expert guys didn't pay us nineteen hundred dollars by the thirtieth, then you know we're going to be in you know, big trouble. Like in this case, you see the May payroll ended up taking us down into, you know, negative dollars in this scenario. So obviously in this scenario, uh, we were in trouble if we didn't have, find something to do within that time. So having this sort of visibility is, is so important because otherwise you can really find yourself just in debt before you even really realize what happened. Money, cash flow goes in so fast. I mean, when you're dealing with numbers like you know, even couple tens of thousands of dollars or thousands of dollars, it's amazing how fast that will come and go. And so stay on top of that. So find yourself a mentor. Um, I was not very good at sales, as I mentioned. So I went out and I found myself a mentor who, this Xerox guy, who was good at sales. Um, again, because I, I had this thing where I lied to TMP, I get it. I get enough of this. And again, although it equipped me for a lot of things, there's so many little intricacies that a mentor just can totally fill you in on. And um, we would meet once or twice a month. I'd have his phone number, so if I had to call him and ask him something, I'd just ask him. I'd bounce um, ideas off of him as far as uh, you know uh, contracts were concerned. So saying, well, does this seem like a fair deal? Am I doing the right thing as for asking for this much money up front? So on and so forth. And you know, the bottom line was he loved it. I mean, he was totally free, but they absolutely love mentoring you because you are this little youthful ball of energy that's out there trying to do this whole business thing. And they just look at you and they're like, wow, I was kind of like that one day and just absolutely love it. And so they'll give you more help than you even thought you wanted. And it's great. And it's, it's totally free, very useful help. And if you listen to them, they'll, they'll give you a lot of good stuff. So the last one is respect your exit strategy. Uh, you want to make sure you have an exit strategy going in. You're not just going in to run a business just to see how it goes. Uh, you got to have some plan of what you want to do with this business. Do you want to build this thing so you can sell it? Do you want to have? You want to get acquired? What's your time frame for acquisition? What? All those decisions will help you figure out what your plan is for execution to get to that point. And so just having that defined early is important. And then making sure you're on track with that. This is kind of just staying in, you know, keeping on track with your business plan in general. But as a part of that, keeping an eye on the prize. Why are you putting yourself through this? 
And it's easy sometimes to forget. It's super easy to get lost in the day to day of I am putting out this fire. I have to get this work done. And so, uh, you know, I'm not sure if um, I, I don't really care where I'm going with it. You just got to constantly stay on top of it and be honest with yourself. You know, in my case, I had to recognize that my exit strategy was uh, no longer attainable. I mean, and I think I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more, but the idea being that, um, you know, you got to make sure that as you're going, you have something you're working towards. Otherwise, why are you doing it? So where has this left me? After all these lessons and running this business and whatnot for a couple of years, um, I went ahead and I shut down Pacific Swell in 2010. Uh, I did that for a couple of reasons. I always blame it on the economy. That's the easiest thing. But in all honesty, it was uh, our products were becoming very commoditized. And as part of the economy, um, that meant to just slug fest with other vendors to, for customers to uh, get your, our product in there at the cheapest possible price. We had other competitors that would be promising stuff that we knew were impossible. They could not possibly make a profit, let alone not be in the red by doing a project at that price, but they would still bid it anyway just to get the job, just so they could get some cash flow going. And it, it was a really bad time. And when you're in a commoditized market like that, that's absolutely what you'll see. And so that's something to, to keep in mind there. Uh, and the biggest thing for me was that that passion that was driving me had evaporated. What I was now doing was I was, not, I was trying to convince people to buy something on price of saying, you know, hey, well, I got the cheapest price here. And it was, it was not fun. We, we started the business because we were developing something cool. We were making some really neat software that we were able to sell. And we, were, we got into some really cool custom projects where we were building all these neat uh, communication systems and so on and so forth. All that went away. And then we just had to fall back to this commoditized stuff. And it got very frustrating. And, um, we, want, we sat back and we said, OK, well, we have, we have three options. We can, one, just stay the course and hope it gets better and uh, you know, hope we don't go deeply, deeply in debt. <clears throat> two, we could sit back and we could say, well, you know, this is a good ride. I don't see where this is going. Uh, we should get out while we're ahead. Or three. Uh, let's reinvent ourselves. Let's find another way. Let's, let's really honestly go out, look at the market, find a niche that we can tackle, go out and, and find a way to, to make it, this business work. And what we ended up finding was that, one, it's just not a good idea when you just know that you're not going anywhere. You will go bankrupt. Um, two was what we ended up doing. And three was... Uh, we couldn't find anything. We, uh, we had a lot of good ideas. We had a lot of really cool ideas, but we at that point had been beaten down enough by some of the other ideas that um, you know, we, didn't have, we didn't have one that we thought could actually get us further along. And so we, fa we made the prudent decision of, of shutting down. So we sold our contracts and customers, and we were able to get out in the black um, so that you know, at 25, I didn't have a bankruptcy on my, uh, on my record. So, but all that afforded me some excellent customers, one of them being Unwired Revolution. And so what's kind of neat about them is I'm a, an intrapreneur there right now. So they're a smaller organization with a very entrepreneur sort of spirit and, um, and way of doing things. I mean, I work from home. I have my own hours. I just have to clock my time. And it's a great gig. I get a, a paycheck, which is something I'm not used to still. <laughs> and. Uh, um, you know, we have a niche market. We have great customers. I, I'm building all these relationships and skills in, in an area that I hadn't had before. All the while, keeping all this stuff that I've used, uh, learned through through my past experience. I'm doing this on my own, and and using that in in the company. And um, the my employer loves it. They've because of everything I've been through within the first year of me being there. They they promoted me to being a director uh, on the business development team of the whole company. And which they would never do for just another tech guy. But from all that experience and whatnot, I was able to offer some really good insight and know how to communicate and so on and so forth. So they really liked that, and it was a, it's a great opportunity. And then occasionally I have these little side projects. Um, because I can't quite get the full entrepreneur out of me, I, uh, I work on these little things on the side. 
and the employer fully knows about them, which I would highly recommend you do, and make sure that there's full disclosure there. But um, yeah, this is, a, this is a neat project, and I'll talk about it in a second right now. So <clears throat> presence is the latest thing that we've been work I've been working on on this side. So this is, uh, I think it's a pretty cool app and interested to hear some of your, your thoughts and whatnot. But it's, uh, it's an app and service, and basically it gives you the ability to see the availability of the person you're going to call before you call them. Now, you, you have these automatic status updates, which I'll show you in a second. Um, we have, I have a patent that I put out for that, where if you are um, like walking on a campus, it will automatically set your status to busy. And uh, if, you, uh, if you have a certain event on your calendar, it will mark you to a certain status during that point. So the, the goal being that if I'm going to call you, I will know if you're going to be busy or not before I, I make that call. And if you are busy, I could subscribe to your, your uh, status saying that when you become available, let me know. It will send me a beep, a notification. Or I could send an instant high definition voicemail, which just avoids the need to have to call and wait for a ring and so on and so forth. So all of this, all the skill to build this and whatnot, has all come out of my past experiences with the technology, with running a business, and all the valuation of how we're going to sell this thing, which I'll tell you about in a second, is all from my past experience of going out and doing this. So for instance, if you are, when you walk onto UCSB, you could say that, well, I walk into that region, mark me as do not disturb. And then when I leave, it will put me back to available. You can manually override that with a note as well, so using some of those interactions there. And we, re we recreated the way that you can reach out and call somebody. Uh-oh. OK. So uh, that's, uh, that's how you can do it um, like that. And so very simple, very clean interface. And the idea is that it's just the next generation of how I think phones should be working. So we're offering it for free, which I think is kind of interesting from an entrepreneur standpoint. It's like, OK, well, where's the, where's the business model? Where's the valuation? How am I going to make money from this whole thing? What's my exit strategy, right? So it's built entirely by myself and my brother, who's a graphic designer. So we're working on this on, on the side. So our cost structure is very low. We fortunately have the skills. He has the past design skills. I have the past engineering skills and software writing skills to be able to do this without having to go outside and, and pay for it. So we can go out and make that happen. We're not quitting our day jobs in case it blows up and nothing comes of it. Um, but it's, uh, but it, it's something we're getting out there that's viral by nature. In order for it to work, you and your friends have to have the app, at least at this point. And so it's a, it's a neat way to, to cre have a kind of viral, automatically generating subscriber base. Because there's not, and so the app is filled with ways of sharing and telling your other friends about it. And all you have to do is once you get the app, all your friends automatically show up who also have the app. There's no need to do re invites and stuff like that. So, a product that automatically motivates other people to, to download and buy, and well, not buy, but to get on that platform is a very interesting business model. Um, and it's fundable. We went out and we talked to a couple of venture capitalists. and. They basically said what I was saying, which was, well, we don't want to take your money until we need it, because we've gone all this way. There's no need to take venture capital and give away a portion of what you're building until you absolutely have to. Like, so say, for instance, in our case, what we want to do is we want to go put it out there, see who latches onto it. Is it students? Is it going to be businesses? Is it where, who's, who's going to really pick this up? And then from that research, we're going to go out, and we're going to say, OK, well, maybe we need some money from venture capitalists or whatnot, or angel investors to say, OK, well, we want to build up this portion of the software that will allow us to get more of those people. And maybe some of those features that we add in are going to be something that you pay for in an app. And so there is a market, and so there's some monetization strategy there. But the idea is get the subscriber base as big as possible. The ultimate goal is to see uh, how many people we can get out there. And the end exit strategy is to have someone buy this. So, We'll see what happens. <laughs> so we're looking to release it. It's stuck in the App Store. Um, like I mentioned, we do have some patents that have already gone through trademarks and whatnot. So a lot of new experiences for me there as well. I haven't done a patent before, but that was a, it was a provisional patent. It only cost 250 bucks. Way better than the full patent. That's something like 10 grand or more. 
So we're looking to get that launched. Um, so that's the website. There's nothing there now. But eventually, um, yeah, I, I think it could be something pretty neat. So about seven more minutes. Perfect. So the big question, would I do all this again? I, I went through some pretty heavy things there, right? I mean, from evil people to businesses not paying on time to you know, some, some struggles. And I would still absolutely do it all over again. Um, I mean, the reality is, having gone through that experience, I'm just light years beyond my peers as far as experience is concerned. I mean, no one, just by nature of going through those steps, I have gained such a unique edge that, I mean, I, employers would always love that sort of experience. And it's, it's proven itself in my current job and other customer interactions that I've had. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much um, interest, having gone through this, uh, garters. Um, so yeah, so part of that is I've built great relationships through the whole process. I get to have the chance to come back here and talk to all you guys. It's it's fantastic. And so, and you know, as we've seen, a lot of the successes and failures have now prepped me to do this whole presence thing that you know may have a chance to it. So I think my story is far from over. But I think that had I not gone through the whole process, I'd be a lot less uh, prepared to be able to do what I'm doing now. But I would do a few things. So those 15 things. I, those, I think those are very helpful things to know, um, especially the whole passion piece. You've got to have the passion, or else you're going to burn out very fast. So it's a little bit of motivation. Uh, we're all to do, you know, we all want to be entrepreneurs here. We all want to be successful. We want to start our own thing. Whatever our motivation is, um, it's actually a awesome time <laughs> to do it. I couldn't say it if you were graduating two years ago. But right now um, is an excellent time to be doing a lot of this stuff. You, you have um, the economy is coming back up slowly but surely. People are buying again. We're seeing a lot more investment in business. Um, we're just in an innovative area or era in general. There's just a lot of technology out there. There's a lot of interest in a lot of different areas where you can really sink your teeth into and, and do something. Um, also, coming out of college, it's the least responsibility you're ever going to have. Uh, I mean, you may already have a lot of responsibilities, but you may not. And that makes it a perfect platform for you to go out and make, do not stupid stuff, but go risk it. Go out there. What do you have to lose? I mean, you don't you know, invest your entire life savings in an idea in, in hopes that it's going to all work out. But go out there and take some challenge, take some risks. Go challenge the big, <laughs> some, other, uh, some big companies with their ideas and see what you can do. You know, of course, do some of that validation. Make sure you're on the right track. But there's no reason to not go out there and give it a shot right now. And uh, throughout the whole thing, if I learn anything, just be prepared to fail. But not fail in a, in a terribly bad way, but fail that you will pick up what you've learned and how you failed, and you will not make that mistake again. And you'll just be that much better and more equipped to go forward. So that's it.